So today I would like to talk to you guys about a disease that I'm particularly interested in, and that's the acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS, for about 20 minutes or so. And then I would like to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in my lab, where we look at the new therapeutic options against ARDS. And we are particularly interested in a special group of potassium channels, so-called two-poor domain potassium channels, and, um, and see how activation or inhibition of those channels can modify the inflammation that we see in ARDS. So to start off the talk, I wanted to um, talk to you a little bit about why do we care about ARDS, and not so much just as pediatrician, but why do we care about ARDS as physicians? The reason is that ARDS is a disease not only of the adults or the children, we see it in both populations. The adults see more ARDS than we do in pediatrics, they in fact see about almost 200,000 cases of ARDS a year, which in the adult ICU accounts for almost 75,000 deaths per year. And that translates into over 2 million ICU days in the adult population. In pediatrics, we see um, almost 8,000 cases a year, which accounts for about 1,500 deaths in children. And for us, that translates into over 60,000 ICU days. You can see down there in the corner, the reference from the New England Journal of Medicine is 2005. These numbers have actually not changed in the last 10 years, and that's, actually a bit, that's obviously a big problem for us. So what is the cost of mechanically ventilated patients for us? The national cost for us of, of keeping people on ventilators is $27 billion per year. And if a patient is on a ventilator, the, the, uh, the ventilator part and everything that comes with it usually is about one-third of the total ICU costs billed to that patient. Simply being on a ventilator doubles a patient's um, length of hospital stay and triples a patient's ICU cost. And again, being on a ventilator adds about an average, and this is between children and adults, about extra $1,500 per ICU day in the cost of taking care of the patient. But there's not only the short-term costs of the actual hospitalization, there's um, the cost of the long-term consequences of ARDS. And there's a lot of adult literature coming out looking at these uh, patients after discharge now. And in fact, in the adults, there is, and this is not much difference in kid, different in kids, there's about a 40% rehospitalization rate at two years after a patient is, diagno is diagnosed and discharged with ARDS. And the post-discharge cost in the first two years is almost $30,000. And in the adults, only 50% of adults that are discharged with a diagnosis of ARDS go back to work by one year after discharge. In kids, we know very little about the long-term um, functional consequences of discharging these patients with ARDS. And obviously, in the, in the era of managed health care and cost-effective cost medicine, what we keep on talking about now every day, mechanical ventilation is clearly a prime target um, to look for cost reduction. So let's briefly talk about what causes ARDS. ARDS can be caused by direct lung insults or by indirect lung insults. Among the direct lung insults, um, especially in pediatrics, pneumonia is by far the most common reason. But other reasons, uh, other causes uh, for ARDS are aspiration, drowning, inhalation of toxins, uh, trauma to the chest, radiation, and for the purpose of today's talk, hyperoxia exposure. Among the indirect insults um, to, that can um, occur and lead to ARDS, sepsis is by far the most common, but also pancreatitis, anaphylactic reactions, um, cardiopulmonary bypass, traumatic brain injury, um, blood transfusion reactions, or ingestion of toxins can all lead to ARDS as well. So you probably noticed by now that we did not start the presentation off with a case report. The reason for that are a few. One is that you, all, you guys all know what a patient with ARDS looks like. The problem is that there's so many causes that can lead to ARDS that describing the intrinsic details of the hospital stay of one patient may be fairly relevant or completely irrelevant to the treatment and the management of the next patient. What is though very important, I believe, is the sequence of events that happens to ARDS patients once they enter the, the medical system. So as we just heard, there's many causes that can lead to ARDS. 
So if a given patient presents in the emergency room with some type of respiratory distress associated with hypoxia and hypoxemia, which is one of the key features of ARDS, the first thing in the oxygen, what do we do after we give Rosefin? Oxygen, right? Everybody gets oxygen. So you show up in the emergency room, you get immediately put on oxygen, maybe even on transport. And this is not oxygen the way the neonatologists use it in the delivery room, but you start with room air and slowly titrate up to you know, appropriate saturation. This is 100% oxygen right off the bat, probably at high flow, likely with a non rebreather mask. So this is high, high percentage oxygen. The patient gets worse, ends up in the ICU, gets transferred to, to, to the ICU, where eventually, a few hours later, the next day, the patient gets intubated. And then what we see on the follow-up x-ray, this is what the lungs look like, and the patient's in full-blown ARDS. So this is this sequence of events where a patient presents with some type of respiratory illness, gets put on high-dose oxygen, then gets put on positive pressure ventilation, and ends up with bad lungs. This is what's going to be important for the second part of the talk, where we talk about what we do in our lab and how we mimic this kind of scenario. So how do you end up with lungs this bad? So let's talk about ARDS pathophysiology in two minutes, or hopefully less, actually. The two main insults that occur in, in the lungs of ARDS patients are one, alveolar and interstitial inflammation and recruitment of inflammatory cells to these lungs and activation of those cells in the lungs. And two, the loss of the alveolar barrier function, which results in fluid leakage into the alveoli alveolar flooding and what we clinically call pulmonary edema. And the combination of those two insults creates a highly pro-inflammatory environment in the, in the alveolar um, tissue. When we look at this very complicated slide uh, uh, a little bit more um, in a simplified manner, you can see that there is infiltration of um, inflammatory cells, macrophages, and neutrophils in the alveolar space as well as the inter interstitial tissues. These cells get activated, they release um, multiple, multiple very potent pro-inflammatory cytokines, which causes damage to the type 1 um, alveolar cells that line the alveolar walls uh, and cause the squamation of the epithelium from the alveolar wall. At the same time, you get um, capillary leakage, which again promotes the infiltration of even more inflammatory cells into the alveoli as well as into the interstitium and um, flooding of the alveoli, and again, leading to pulmonary edema. Type 2 alveolar cells, um, some people consider them, quote unquote, the stem cells of the lung, are very important in uh, healing of the epithelial layer. And they can actually transform from an alveolar type 2 cell into alveolar type 1 cell during alveolar wound healing. The term ARDS was actually coined in um, 1976 by a physician called David Ashbaugh, who was at the Ohio State University at the time. And um, he described in Lancet um, a sequence of 12 patients with acute respiratory distress that he, at the time, for him, ARDS was actually, actually stood for the adult respiratory distress syndrome. So these 12 patients, out of these 12 patients, seven died. And when he looked at the autopsy of these 12 patients, he found consistently that the lungs of these patients all showed alveolar adelectasis, engorged capillaries, and hyaline membranes. And as he describes these lungs, he wrote that these lungs look remarkably similar to what even by then was already known as the inf infantile respiratory distress syndrome. That report in 1967 was also the first report um, of ventilatory management using PEEP. About almost 30 years later, the Americans and the Europeans got together in the so-called, uh, they, they didn't have a lot of, um, no, you know, nowadays conference have like catchy names. Back in the day, it was simply the American-European Consensus Conference. Um, the, the, the investigators there realized that by then, ARDS clearly wasn't a disease of just the adults. It clearly occurred in children as well. So they renamed ARDS from adult uh, to acute. So now, since... 94, it's called the acute respiratory distress syndrome. And they came up with four criteria that a patient had to meet to be diagnosed with ARDS. This is important because this is what all of you guys have been taught in medical school and 
probably are still being taught. But all this is not true anymore. So I want to show you where you're coming from and what we expect next time you come to the ICU to tell us when we ask you how we, get, how we diagnose ARDS. So all of you here remember that for ARDS you have to have acute onset of disease, you have to have new bilateral infiltrates on chest x-ray. You have to make sure that the changes on chest x-ray are not caused by heart failure. So back in 1994, the way to do that, you had to have a normal left atrial pressure or uh, wedge pressure. And then you had to define the degree of hypoxemia, which at the time we defined with a PaO2 to FiO2 ratio. So the milder form of ARDS with a PF ratio of 300 to 200 was called acute lung injury. And the more severe form with a PF ratio of less than 200 was called ARDS. Probably the most cited paper in ARDS history is this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine from the year 2000. And in this paper, the investigators from the ARTSNET trial got together <clears throat> and compared patients ventilated with what they called low tidal volume ventilation, which they set as 6 ml per kilogram ideal body weight, compared to patients ventilated with what was back then the more traditional tidal volume of 12 ml per kilogram. And what they found, the trial was actually stopped early because there was such a tremendous benefit in survival in the group, uh, in the low tidal volume group. So they found an 8% reduction in mortality in the low tidal volume group, which in clinical study terms is a huge difference in mortality. This is important because many, many times when we stand in the ICU around a ventilator and we ask you, what should we put a patient, what tidal volume should we use for a patient, we come up with these numbers. I can't stress enough that this is true for ARDS. This, we know very little whether this is true for anybody else but the ARDS DS patient. So a patient that gets intubated in the ER for a seizure or in the OR for a broken bone, this does not you can't cite this paper and say we should ventilate them with low tidal volume because that's what the ARTSNET people said. This is true for ARDS, but not necessarily for anything else. So interesting enough, in 2000, we said you should ventilate ARDS patients with low tidal volumes. Nine years later, we looked at the pediatric data in ARDS, and sure enough, we found that the hospital mortality rate was 18% lower than reported previously for pediatric acute lung injury. So is this because we all switched to low tidal volume ventilation in the pediatric population? We have not, I'm not really sure, but not a whole lot else had changed in those nine years, except for all of us tending to use more low tidal volume ventilation. So it may not be all of it, but it's certainly a very important part of why the mortality rate in pediatrics, which at the time was still in the 30, 40 percent range, range, dropped to the teens where we see it now. However, clinicians and investigators weren't too happy with this American European Consensus um, Conference guidelines. One of the big problems was that they never defined the amount of PEEP that should be used. And you know, by 2000, 2010, it became increasingly clear that PEEP plays a huge role in the outcomes of ARDS patients. So the uh, the smart, smart physicians got together again in Berlin this time in 2012 and came up with what we call the Berlin definition um, for ARDS. And now for the first time, there's a requirement for a PEEP of at least five or greater. The other problem we started running into, again, not just the pediatricians, the adult as well, that by 2012, not everybody had a swan gans catheter in place anymore to measure a left atrial pressure. In Pete's, we, we never really did anyway so much, but the adults still had most of the patients swaned in the ICU. But now even the adults having problems too, diagnosing patients with ARDS because they didn't have a swan gans in place anymore. So in 2012, we removed the requirement to measure uh, uh, wedge pressure. And the determination of heart failure or not became much more up to the physician um, to make. The other important thing that happened in 2012 was in the Berlin definition, we eliminated the word acute lung injury altogether. And we started calling um, the three degrees of ARDS simply mild, moderate, and severe ARDS based on the, the uh, degree of hypoxemia. And this year, in 2015, for the first time, the pediatricians got together 
and said, well, we are still not really happy with this ARDS definition. We're still struggling in pediatrics. So let's come up with something that's more practical for pediatricians. And the two main changes that were introduced in this uh, Pediatric Acute Lung Injury Consensus Conference, which is a really interesting name since I just told you three years ago we abolished the term acute lung injury altogether, but yet three years later we called the conference the Pediatric Acute Lung Injury Conference. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the pediatrician started introducing um, the oxygen index instead of the PaO2 FiO2 ratio. And the reason for going um, towards the oxygen index as a measurement of hypoxemia is that the oxygen index actually takes into account the mean airway pressure. And mean airway pressure seems to become more and more important in the outcomes of ARDS patients. They even went a step further. Not only do we not have swan guns catheters in kids, but the reality is, and you guys will know, we don't even have arterial line at all times in kids with ARDS, right? Sometimes we just can't get them, other times they lose them, and we can't get another one in. Or we feel like we, we are okay with our VBGs and CBGs and all these other gases. So they went one step further and said that if there is no arterial line in place which would allow us to calculate an oxygen index, we can actually use what they call the oxygen saturation index, which replaces the PA or two with uh, peripheral saturations. So now we can diagnose ARDS, not only without a swan gans catheter, but it's even without an arterial line. And this gives us what I myself call the practical beats ARDS criteria. So this is the latest, newest when we talk about ARDS. We divide ARDS, depending on the degree of hypoxemia, in three, uh, in three categories. Mild ARDS, moderate ARDS, severe ARDS, based on the oxygen index. And the way we do it with the oxygen index is an oxygen index 4 to 8 is mild, 8 to 16 is moderate, and anything greater than 16 is severe. Um, in, the absence of an, in, a, in the absence of an arterial line or an oxygen index, we can use the oxygen saturation index, where we use peripheral saturations to replace the, um, the PaO2. And the numbers from mild, moderate to severe shift a little bit, but the, but the ballpark is about the same. To diagnose ARDS, you still have to have acute onset of disease, which in 1994 was not too well defined, actually. Nowadays, it's seven days or less. So the, the disease has to have an acute onset of within the last week. You have to have new chest x-ray infiltrate or infiltrates. So the requirement for bilateral infiltrates was removed, and an, a new infiltrate on chest x-ray now suffices for the diagnosis of ARDS. And um, you still have to make a judgment call that the changes on x-ray are not due to heart failure. And that is now left up to the physician. There's no more left atrial pressure measurement required. Uh, most people make the diagnosis clinically or with an echo. So let's change gear just a little bit towards the type of ARDS that I am particularly interested in. I'm particularly interested in ventilator-induced ARDS. In ventilator-induced ARDS, the two main insults happening to the lungs are the hyperoxia exposure and the mechanical stretch, which occurs um, due to the mechanical uh, ventilators um, that we put these patients on. Mechanical ventilators became indispensable for the first time truly in 1952 during the polio epidemic in Copenhagen, Denmark where the use of ventilators decreased the mortality rate from polio, which at the time was over 80%, down to less than 40%. This almost never happened in, in medical history, that the mortality rate was cut in half by one single intervention, um, except for maybe vaccinations. <coughs> at the time, ventilators didn't look quite as slick as they look today. They were called the iron lungs. They had some gadgets like in the era of selfies, like having a mirror would be great again if you could put one of those on our ventilators. But also, you know, patient pairing with nurses became a lot more easy than nowadays with private rooms. Um, nevertheless, during the uh, polio epidemic, when the physicians looked at the lungs of the patients that did die on, the, on these ventilators, 
they found that these lungs were actually quite injured. And a paper in 1956, so the epidemic started in 52 and 56, Avignon described these changes in the, in the lungs of these ventilator patients in a paper called The Pulmonary Complications in, Resp in Respirator Patients. And um, in 1967, the term respirator lung syndrome was actually coined. So the changes that they saw in that polio epidemic and from then on in mechanically ventilated patients actually became a real thing. And you may remember 67 was also the same year that Ashbaugh in Ohio term, uh, came up with his term for these changes and he called it the adult respiratory lung syndrome. So the respirator lung syndrome and the adult respiratory uh, distress syndrome were actually um, coined in the same year. But the idea that positive pressure application to your lungs could actually be harmful goes hundreds of years back. On November 11th in 1732, a coal mining accident occurred in England, and one of the coal miners had passed out, had fainted due to inhalation of uh, coal fumes. And a Scottish surgeon called uh, William Dossach was called to the scene, and he performed life-saving mouth-to-mouth resuscitation to the coal miner. And I want to share with you what he wrote about his experience quite almost 15 years later. He wrote, I applied my mouth close to his and blowed my breath as strong as I could, but having neglected to stop his nostrils, all the air came out of them. Wherefore, taking hold of him with one hand and laying my other on his breast at the left pap, pap is the nipple, I blew again my breath as strong as I could, raising his chest fully with it, and immediately I felt six or seven very quick beats of the heart. His thorax continued to play, and the pulse was felt soon after in the arteries. I then opened a vein in his arm, which, after giving a small jet, sent out the blood in drops only for a quarter of an hour, and then he bled freely. That's how you assess blood pressure back in the day. In the meantime, I caused him to be pulled, pushed, and rubbed to assist the motion of his blood as much as I could, washed his face and temples with water, and rubbed sal volatile, which was uh, Latin for smelling salts, on his nose and lips. I'm telling this story to tell you another story. Two years before Dossack wrote this up, John Fothergill heard about the story or knew about the story. And he had his own thoughts about positive pressure application to, to uh, patient lungs. So he heard about this coal miner who was dead in appearance, but was successfully treated by mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. And his thoughts on all of this was that Mouth-to-mouth -mouth was preferable to bellows because the lungs of one man can bear without injury as great a force of those of another man can exert, which by the bellows cannot always be determined. So he already had a suspicion that if you blow the volume of your lung into somebody equally sized, the chances you're causing a lot of damage is less than applying some kind of device and just pushing an unknown amount of pressure into somebody else's lung. But let's go back to modern times again and, uh, and, and look at modern ventilator-induced lung injury. What we do know nowadays is that mechanical forces and hyperoxia, especially in combination, but also one, one at a time, can alter transepithelial ion transport in the lung, which causes a net decrease in alveolar fluid clearance, which then translates into the formation of pulmonary edema. And pulmonary edema by itself directly relates to the length of mechanical ventilation of a patient and to patient mortality. So the goals of ARDS therapy are two. One is to provide adequate gas exchange. The second goal is to avoid secondary <coughs> injury. The problem we face nowadays is that the two main strategies we employ to treat patients with ARDS are on one hand life-saving but on the other hand, clearly harmful to the lungs. And that's a huge dilemma. And that is why we desperately need new therapeutic approaches against ARDS. So what do we have right now again? So we heard about low tidal volume ventilation, probably with high PEEP is beneficial to ARDS, ARDS patient outcomes. We think now proning is kind of going in and out. At the moment, proning is back in again. So we think proning of patients is good, but outside, those measurements, we really don't have 
anything that has panned out to truly and consistently improve the outcomes of patients with ARDS. And that is true for kids as well as for adults. Neuromuscular blockade appears to be beneficial if applied early within the first 24 to 48 hours. Afterwards, it does not change mortality anymore. But there have been multiple trials with surfactant therapy, nitric oxide, steroids, and high frequency, um, or the oscillator, with none of them having shown consistent improvement in patient care. Surfactant therapy, it seems like we have sort of mostly given up on surfactant therapy, to be honest. Nitric oxide is coming and going a little bit. It is clear that nitric oxide improves the oxygenation of these patients, but it does not improve the mortality rates. So you wonder how much good we do by treating patients, making the numbers look better, but then the mortality is still the same. Steroids could be more than a whole lecture by itself. The short of it is, we don't know. My personal belief about steroids is that we should definitely not, not give up on steroids yet. I think we have used them the wrong way. We have traditionally used high-dose steroids for short periods of time, which now with extensive adult literature and a lot of adult studies, it appears that lower low dose steroids for prolonged periods of time with long weaning may actually be beneficial, not only for ARDS, probably even for pneumonia. So I think we have just used them the wrong way. We know very little about steroids in health. We, we know virtually nothing about steroids and disease, and we certainly don't know how to come off steroids properly quite yet. So there's still much more to come on steroids and ARDS in, the, in your guys' future. And high frequency, high frequency is an iffy thing these days because uh, two years ago now, uh, two big studies came out in adults again. One showed increased mortality with ARDS patients put on oscillators, and the other one showed no benefit. We always make the argument that we are so much better at using oscillators than the adults are, which is ob obviously totally true. And I'm not joking about that. I think that is actually true. And I think there is still a role for the oscillator in pediatric ARDS management. Um, we use it mostly as a rescue therapy, and which may lead us to the high mortality rates we see, but uh, I would not give up on the oscillator in pediatrics quite yet. So in the search for new therapeutic strategies, desperately needed new therapeutic strategies against ARDS, my lab focuses on stretch-activated ion channels. The reason we look at stretch-activated ion channels is that in tissues other than the lung, we know that these channels can act as mechanosensors, they can act as mechanotransducers, and many of them are actually regulated by hyperoxia. And that combination of features um, earned them the designation of signal integrators. Stretch-activated ion channels is a huge term that encompasses a large variety of ion channels, including sodium channels, chloride channels, calcium channels. And for today's, for the last uh, 10 minutes or so of the talk, the, the channels that we particularly focus on are the potassium channels. What all these channels have in common is that they are activated by mechanical stretch and they are inhibited by gadolinium. These channels are in one way or another expressed virtually in all body tissues and they regulate a large variety of biological functions. Within the very large group of potassium channels, my research focuses on a fairly small subfamily called the two poor domain potassium channels. They have six, um, there are six subfamilies within that family, and they have funny names like twig, thick, track, task, talk, and trask. The twig channel was the first one identified and simply stands for tandem of poor domains, weakly, inwardly rectifying potassium channel. And then we got really lazy. Um, when we named the other ones, I'm particularly interested in TREC. TREC simply stands for twig related potassium channel. That's all we had to, to um, that, that's all we could come up with. The TREC family has three members, TREC, TREC1, and TREC2. The reason I'm interested in, in, in that group there is that they are exquisitely stretch sensitive, much more than all the other ones. So what do we know about TREC channels in general in vivo? We know that the TREC deficient mouse has a depression resistant phenotype. So those are all happy mice. Um, in humans, we know that many of the SSRIs that we use these days, including fluoxetine, actually block TREC1 channels in the brain. So there is a function of TREC1 channels in the brain for sure. We know virtually nothing about not only the function, but we know nothing about the existence of TREC1 channels in the lung, and certainly we know absolutely nothing about the potential role of TREC channels in the context of ARDS. 
So the first question we asked in our lab was, are track channels even expressed in alveolar epithelial cells in the lung? We used real-time PCR in cultured alveolar epithelial cells, and we exposed them to hyperoxia for 16 hours, and we simply looked at gene expression. And what we found was, when we looked at the three members of the track family, TREC1, TREC2, and TRAC, that the TREC1 channel was substantially downregulated after hyperoxia exposure, almost threefold. Then we tried to mimic the combination of hyperoxia and mechanical ventilation, and we exposed the cells first to hyperoxia for six hours, and then mechanically stretched them for four hours. And what we found was that the TREC1 gene expression was even further downregulated, now to almost sixfold, whereas TREC2 and TREC um, expression didn't really change at all. So this is a nice gene expression change, but we really wanted to know what happens to the protein. So we used confocal microscopy and stain for TREC channels, again here in cultured alveolar epithelial cells. And the TREC1 staining is shown in green, and you can see it's mostly plasma membrane staining that you can see in the control cells. When we expose these cells to 48 hours of hyperoxia, you can see that the green staining almost completely disappears. So hyperox exposure downregulated TREC gene expression in lung alveolar epithelial cells but it also downregulated TREC protein expression. Now we wanted to know, well, what ha does this happen in the, in the animal as well? So we exposed live mice to hyperoxia for 48 hours, cut the lungs out, stained again for the TREC channel in green here, and we found the same thing we found in the cell cultures. In control, in slices of control mice that were only sitting there at room air, see a lot of TREC staining throughout the lung. These black holes are alveolar spaces. And in the um, mice exposed to hyperoxia for 48 hours, we see a substantial decrease in track staining. So it's true in cell culture, it's true in the mouse as well. So what I believe happens in the lung is that the two key insults that occur in ventilator-induced ARDS, which are hyperoxia exposure and mechanical stretch, regulate the function and the expression of track channels in lung resident cells, such as epithelial and endothelial cells, as well as in lung inflammatory cells and lung immune cells. I believe that in turn, these TREC channels regulate inflammatory cytokine secretion, surfactant levels, and alveolar barrier function. And I'm going to show you one or two slides on each one of these components, and then we're going to conclude the talk. Let's start with alveolar barrier function. The way we measure alveolar barrier function in the lab is by using a so-called ESIS model. ESIS stands for Electric Cell Substrate Impedance Sensing. Very simply, it's a chip that has eight wells that you can seed cells into, and you let the cells sit there and grow to confluence. Then you shoot an electrical current through the well, and as you can imagine, as the cells grow tighter, the re electrical resistance across that monolayer of cells becomes higher. Does that make sense? So this is what an experiment looks like. Um, initially, we seeded the cells and we let them grow for about a day. You see the resistance increases over time as the cells grow tighter, they form tight junctions. And then we did uh, two things. So we took one batch of cells and kept them at room air, and we took one batch of cells and put them for 48 hours in hyperoxia. We had two types of cells at that point. We had control cells, and we created a cell line that was deficient in the track one channel. So we had these two cell types, one hand sitting on Romare, the other, the other one sitting uh, in the hyperoxia chamber. F after four hours, we brought them back, put them back in our ESIS machine, and looked at the um, electro electrical resistance again. What we found was that in black here, the track one efficient cells and the control cells that were exposed to Romare, or, or that were not exposed to hyperoxia, resistance continued to um, increase and ended up somewhere at here. The control cells that were exposed to hyperoxia lost um, their alveolar barrier function, and we saw exactly what we expected. After hyperoxia exposure, we expected a decrease in resistance because the epithelium is getting leaky, less tight. What was really surprising, though, was that the cells that were deficient in TREC1 after hyperoxia exposure barely showed any changes. They seemed protected from the damaging effects of hyperoxia by just knocking out one potassium channel in these cells. I'm not going to show you the slide, but this is actually true if you do this experiment with TNF-alpha as well. So TNF-alpha, as you know, was one of the main cytokines found in the bronchial wheel of lavage fluid of patients. The TREC1 deficient cells seem to be protected from TNF-alpha toxicity as well. 
So to summarize these, uh, these couple of experiments there, we've, we showed for the first time that TRAC1 is actually expressed in mouse and human alveolar epithelial cells. And we found that at least in cultured alveolar epithelial cells, the deficiency of the TRAC1 potassium channel may protect against hyperoxia. And as I just mentioned, even DNF-alpha induced loss of barrier function. Changing gears one more time a little bit, going back to our model, let's briefly talk about inflammatory cytokine secretion and the potential role of the TREC channels in inflammatory cytokine secretion. We had a very simple setup. Um, we again used the main insults occurring in ventilator-induced ARDS, hyperoxy exposure, and mechanical stretch. And here we also used the NF-alpha as a stimulus, which, as you remember, is a very important cytokine in the alveoli of ARDS patients. And again, we had our two cell types. We had our control cells, and then we had these auto cells that were equal to control cells, except for missing the, the TREC1 potassium channel. And what we did is we measured, using ELISAs, the cytokine secretion in the supernatant from these cells after 24 hours. And what we found was that hyperoxia by itself for cultured alveolar epithelial cells is a fairly weak stimulus for cytokine secretion, whereas TNF-alpha is a very potent stimulus for cytokine secretion, almost so much that even when you combine hyperoxy with TNF-alpha, you don't get a whole lot of additional secretory effect than just with TNF-alpha alone. I don't have a lot of data on stretch by itself yet. That's what we're actually doing this week in the lab. But what we found with the TNF-alpha is that the TREC deficient cells, so significant changes in the cytokine secretion pattern compared to the control cells. TREC deficient cells upon TNF-alpha stimulation secreted less interleukin-6 and less RANTIS. RANTIS is a very important um, chemokine or attractant for neutrophils that recruits neutrophils to the lungs during ARDS. But these cells secreted more MCP1, a monocyte chemotactic protein, which is a chemotractant for monocytes, obviously, but also for neutrophils in the context of ARDS. And we saw no changes in interleukin-8 secretion, which is another important um, key chemokine for neutrophils. When we tried to figure out how does a potassium channel or the deficiency of a potassium channel cause these changes in cytokine secretion, we looked at several intracellular signaling cascades that are known to be activated by TNF-alpha. To make a very long story short, we found changes in several signaling, signaling cascades in TREC1 efficient cells. And what we were trying to do is we tried to align any of these changes with the cytokine secretion that we see. And what we found was that, in fact, the decreased phosphorylation of protein kinase C was most likely responsible for the decrease in IL-6 secretion. Whereas the other, the other obvious pairing was the increase in J and K kinase phosphorylation could be responsible for the increase in MCP1 secretion. This uh, turned out to be true, true, and unrelated. NF kappa B and uh, P38 kinase did not, although P38 kinase was altered, it did not seem to affect uh, or to be related with any of the changes in cytokine secretion we saw um, from these cells. So again, to summarize this little set of experiments here, we saw that TREC1 deficiently altered TNF-alpha-induced interleukin-6, RANTIS, MCP1, but not IL-8 secretion. And the decrease in IL-6 appeared to be related to the decrease in protein kinase C phosphorylation, whereas the increase in MCP1 appeared to be unrelated to the uh, increase in junk kinase phosphorylation. And changing gears one last time, let's briefly talk about um, surfactant level in the lungs, and I want to show you um, some slices uh, of mouse lungs from our TREC knockout mouse model. So what we did again is we exposed control mice, so we call them wild type mice, to either room air or hyperoxia, or put them on a ventilator for two hours, or exposed them to hyperoxia first and then put them on a ventilator. What we did then is we cut the lungs out and stained the lungs for surfactant protein C and looked at those lungs with confocal microscopy. And what you can see here, I think my laser pointer had, oh no, it needs some resuscitation too. Um, what you can see here, the red staining is staining for surfactant protein C. Blue is just a counter stain for nuclei. So at baseline, under room air conditions, our control mice and the mice deficient in the track channel showed basically the same levels of surfactant protein C. Um, but look what happened when we put the mice in the hyperoxia chamber for three days. Control mice barely showed any difference. They still showed about the same amount of surfactant as the uh, mice that were just on Romare. 
But in the track one deficient mice, surfactant almost completely disappeared after three days of hyperoxy exposure. Interestingly, the mice that were put on a ventilator at room air, not with hyperoxia for two hours, showed no changes in surfactant uh, levels in between the control and the track deficient mice. And the mice that were exposed to three days of hyperoxia and then put on a ventilator for two hours, now all got sick. The control mice got sick, got sick and lost all their surfactant, as well as the track deficient mice. So what I want to show you quickly to get a better picture of what these lungs really look like is, I'm just going to show you some pictures of the, of the whole lungs of these animals. So at baseline, under room air conditions, wild type or controlled mouse lungs and the track one channel deficient lungs look pretty much the same. There's no real, not really any much difference between those two. But look what happens to the lungs of these track potassium channel deficient mice after 24 hours of hyperoxia. In the wild type, I wish we could turn the lights down, but we actually can't, I found out. You see a little bit of lung damage right there, but the lungs of the potassium channel deficient mice look absolutely horrible. And the lungs of mice that were put on, on hyperoxy and mechanical ventilation all look absolutely terrible. This is also true when you look at histology. So the control mice at room air without mechanical ventilation and the track deficient mice at room air look about the same healthy lungs but after 24 hours of hyperoxia, the potassium channel deficient mice look absolutely horrible. Tons of inflammation, um, tons of hemorrhage. And the combination of hyperoxia mechanical ventilation causes damage in all lungs. And you can quantify these things with so-called lung injury scores to get actual, actual numbers for this. So going back to, to our little diagram here, it appears that the presence or absence of track channels, at least in the lung epithelial cells, does have substantial effects on all three readouts that we were looking at, inflammatory cytokine secretion, surfactant levels, as well as barrier function. And to conclude all of this, um, from what I've shown you today, is it seems right now that in the cultured lung epithelial cells, TREC1 deficiency appeared protective, whereas in vivo, TREC1 deficiency actually resulted in increased lung injury. And what the molecular mechanisms are for these differences is what we're currently chasing in our lab. So going back to our little sequence of event diagram and the reason why I skipped the case presentation, I believe that the, the time and the amount of hyperoxia that the patient is exposed to prior being necessarily admitted to the ICU, certainly prior to being put on mechanical ventilation, may be a crucial factor for the ultimate outcome of these patients. And I'm going to leave you with the words of Lynn Martin, who said, it would seem ironic that the very existence of humans is fully dependent on a gas that, in excess quantities, is toxic and lethal. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>